Hey folks, welcome to YouTube Live today. We kind of decided to go on live last minute. Uh, we've got a really neat little presentation here that we uh, wanted to discuss. And I'm here with Dakota Cohen from Grassroots Family Farms. Hey folks, how's it going? So tomorrow night, we're going to be putting a webinar on. It's free. Um, it's on the top three things permaculture property owners uh, make um, mistakes that they make, basically, and how you can avoid them. Uh, and so today, we're going to be going through those top three things, uh, as well as how we help our clients to avoid them. So if you're interested in that webinar, space is limited. Uh, hit the, the link below and it'll give you all the information that you need to sign up for the webinar. Um, and if you just want to kind of hang out today and ask a few questions, uh, it's not going to be a long show, but we're going to go through these top three things. And then from there, um, we're going to talk a little bit about our process um, and then close out with uh, some additional information on the webinar. So let's get into it. Also, if you're just signing in, please introduce yourself, let us know where you're coming from, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to post it up into the uh, uh, chat window there. I'll just put a little note up here. So just feel free to introduce yourself and um, love to know where you're coming from, and if you're interested in building a permaculture property of your own, uh, what some of the concerns you might have um, are. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and then we're going to get into it here, guys. All right, so um, let's get into this. So one of the first things that people uh, make as a mistake uh, when it comes to uh, permaculture properties and actually most properties in general. I mean, when we, when we go and look at acreages and farms, um, we are constantly coming up against um, giant mistakes. And I think that it's important to not beat yourself up over it because there's a lot of complexity in buying the right property. Um, and, then, and then once you bought it, actually designing it out. And so we, over the years, uh, Dakota and I consult together and we've been consulting now for close to three years and we've been consulting on our own for many years um, in addition to that, um, have kind of worked out a process to kind of understand what uh, a correct property actually looks like. And so there's kind of two main areas and there's lots of kind of micro areas within these two areas, but essentially when you're trying to find a property um, you really need to figure out what the, the context of the property is. So what does the property want to be? And what are your visions and values? And it's the intersection between those two things that actually creates a correct property purchase. Uh, and so a lot of what we do, people have already gone ahead and purchased the property. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what that intersection point is, if there is one, um, by helping them to distill out their visions and values uh, and, um, and understand what the property, like I said, wants to be. And so that intersection point is what we call the adaptive options. Do you want to add anything to that, Dakota? No, just, just that, um, you know, this is something that it, it seems really, uh, really subtle, but you, you'd be amazed at how many people we've, we've worked with that, um, uh, like they would have saved, you know, thousands of hours and, and, and dollars if they had just bought the right property the first time because you know there wasn't a fit a fit there and and when we you know when people are looking for property it's a it's a very um emotional and a very important decision to make and you know everybody's heard the stories about you know some friends of theirs that go and they they just they, just, they see the property they they know it's the right one because of you know it has a great view or it's like you know, it seems like the stars were aligning and they make it uh, that property purchase from a uh, an emotional place as opposed to from one of, of clarity in, in, in what their what their actual goals are, what their values are for that property. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes it can, it can um, you can get yourself into fighting battles that you never wanted to in the first place. Yeah, totally. And, and actually you have a really great saying um, that we've used a lot in our uh, work together. Uh, how does it go? It's- uh, there, there are no right or wrong decisions, only appropriateness to context. Oh, you have too many good sayings. Uh, the other one I was thinking of was uh, either change your property oh. or change your context. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
What, how, how does that exactly does that go? No, let's that, just, that, let's just, that was just that was just one of the one of the principles that we've come up with uh, in our in our process um, when we're trying to help people identify whether or not it's a fit is uh, is just you have with when you're talking about property context you have you have two options it's either you change where your property is located or you change what your what your vision and values are because if there's if there isn't an alignment there you can spend uh, you know, all the time and money in the world trying to make it fit. But if it doesn't want to, you're going to be forced functioning that system. And so it's much easier to uh, reevaluate what your vision and values are or to physically change where your property is located. And you'll save, you know, tons of time and money that way. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So really getting clear on what you want <clears throat> um, and then understanding what the property wants to be and then figuring out if there's a collaboration between you and the property. And, uh, there usually is, but sometimes it means that you have to change your vision or values uh, or you have to find a different property if, if it doesn't fit. Okay, so the next big mistake that people make um, <clears throat> are climatic and geographic risks. Do you want to uh, start off with this, Dakota? Absolutely. And so this, this kind of ties into uh, the, the property context side of that, um, that Venn diagram we were just talking about. And uh, it's just that the... the one of the most common mistakes that people make when they're, if they've chosen the wrong property um, for the vision and values is that they fail to diagnose what the climatic and geographic risks are for that particular property. So just some of these examples are like if you're in a, um, if you're in a fire ecology um, type biome and you bought a property that's on the top of a hill uh, or in a valley that's um, that's oriented towards the prevailing wind during fire season and your property is located on the, you know, on the, the top of that hill. That's, that's a huge risk. Um, you know, being in drought prone areas in, in floodplains, um, you can have uh, landslides or um, alluvial fans, which is what the, the picture here is showing. <clears throat> um, resource extraction risks like building a property in a uh, sour gas <clears throat> Uh, location where um, you know all that work's already been done like that's the property context extreme yep. weather events like you know um, uh, hail and or tornado zones things like that so th those are all climatic and geographic risks that are associated to a particular property context and um, and they can be very specific because like if, if you were to buy a piece of land that was just on the other side of that uh, alluvial fan uh, in this picture here, you know, you, you might be fine if, if it was, if it was outside of that danger zone, everything else might be a, a fit, but if, if it were located right in the middle of that kind of barrel of a gun, uh, there are uh, huge, um, threats that are associated with that. Like, you know, that's, that's a type one error as, as we call it, which is where you make a design decision that can lead to the loss of, of, uh, property, the loss of life. Yeah, totally. It's amazing how often, I mean, looking at this picture that we have up on the screen, uh, you know, nobody would, most people would understand that building a house in this general region would be a silly idea. Um, and the reason that it's very apparent in this picture is because this is an active alluvial fan. And so we've got lots of sediment coming across this, this, uh, this disc here. But um, it's amazing how often these alluvial fans are actually vegetated. Uh, and people don't see them for what they are and they go and they build um, a property or a house right on top of it and they don't realize as you said they're sitting in a barrel of a gun so a lot of these ge geographic and climatic risks are either um, specific to space time and sometimes when they are specific to space they're hidden they're kind of you need to know what the telltale signs are to be looking for um, so they're hidden in space and time um, and sometimes they're not even hidden but because land design is a complex thing uh people don't even know what they don't know so they're like unknown unknowns to those individuals uh until they all of a sudden are taught what to look for essentially so totally um, well, and, and also like in in the case of like floodplains or even in, in alluvial fans those are often the richest soils like after after the you know if it hasn't been 100 years since there's a there was a, a mudslide or a um, a flood um, and so people are attracted to those areas because they look so beautiful you know there's this there's a creek that runs through the middle of the of the valley there and and so it's like oh wow this is beautiful not taking into account that you're on like the first bench of that floodplain uh in the landscape and uh it's on a hundred year floodplain and it's only yeah. another time before you know something happens where 
before you get another flood. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So um, these are huge, huge problems. They are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars when you get them wrong um, and lots of tears. And so really understanding these constraints before you go and place any infrastructure is really important, which leads us to our next uh, big mistake that we see is poorly placed infrastructure. And so this, is, this leads to all sorts of wasted time and money, pollution, uh, farmer burnout, lack of durability in the structures, loss of property, uh, profitability if, if it's a farm trying to make money, um, and drudgery. So um, with regards to wasted time and money, I mean, when you're working on a property where, or, or on an acreage um, and you're trying to get a certain amount of work done, typically referred to as chores, and you don't have a, a typical or a, a well laid out yard site, you're going to pay the price in your own life energy. Um, to go to you, you've worked on a lot of farms where this has been the case. I mean, we see the, this in our own consultancy as well, but you have a great analogy around uh, work triangles and how that all ties into the design of, of a basic yard site. Absolutely. So when I was taking my, um, my carpentry certificate um, and we were uh, in the program that we were talking about um, like kitchen design, there's a, there's a formula that uh, most people aren't aware of uh, that's actually um, a ratio between the distance between your fridge, um, your sink and your stove and when you have a well-designed kitchen, those uh, the distance between them actually fits into like a known ratio. <clears throat> and if you get it wrong, it, it doesn't it doesn't feel like a good kitchen to be in. It's it's not enjoyable to cook. And so you know we spend a lot of time as um, uh, as house designers, you know, figuring out how to how to make that as efficient as possible because we spend a lot of time there. And you know, just to, uh, for folks to think of, think about the implication of this, I want you to imagine. Uh, what it would be like if your fridge was located uh, downstairs in your basement uh, and your stove was out in your garage. You know, can you just just sit with the, the implications of, of what that would feel like and how, um, how uh, unpleasant cooking would be if you, every time you wanted to get something from the fridge, you had to go down to the basement and every time you wanted to, you know, fry an egg or uh, check on a roast that was in the oven, you had to go to, out to your garage. It just it, it doesn't make any sense. We would never do that. But for some reason, as, um, uh, as landowners, when we step out the front door of our house, we lose all bearings of, of efficiency and effectiveness. And we just start putting things everywhere, you know? Well, um, uh, I, I work with, with folks who walk um, up to 28 kilometers a day just to do chores in their regular workflow patterns. <clears throat> That's been the, the highest, I actually, um, I actually encourage people to put on pedometers or step counters, and then we measure the the uh, um, like what their stride is, and we can figure out the, like the actual uh, length. And if we measure how long uh, it takes them to walk a certain period, we can we can assign a time unit to that um, uh, to that distance that they're walking every day. And again, these are these are chores. This isn't this isn't uh, uh, like um, work that's really contributing to your, your bottom line. These, these are like the things that need to get done. Like you just, you need to go open the chicken door. You need to, uh, you know, feed the pigs, water the cows, move the fences, all this stuff, <clears throat> or can you even just be checking your garden? And if, if we don't get that right, we, uh, we can lose hundreds of hours a, a day. And if we keep adding more complexity, more fridges and stoves into the property, eventually we just, we run out of time and we feel like we're on this, this uh, uh, hamster wheel that we just can't get off of. Yeah, totally. And I mean, a lot of times we can't get uh, access to the higher levels of value on our property as well, which is kind of the pollution comment. Uh, so it's amazing how often our gardens will be disconnected from our food forests or our gardens, uh, or sorry, our chickens are disconnected from our food forests and our gardens. Um, and so then we find ourselves shoveling crap from the chicken coop to the garden or bringing weeds from the garden back to the chicken coop when they could just be properly located. Um, and so pollution is basically just an unused resource. And usually it's not used because there's too much work to put it to productive use as opposed to just connecting the elements properly. Now, Absolutely. burnout is another one that we see a lot in our work. Um, and typically when we get involved and we don't have the, the confirmation bias or the, um, you know, people just kind of accept the drudgery for some reason. We, we haven't quite figured out what that is. Maybe it's just they're, you know, the, they can't see the forest from the trees or anymore, but 
a lot of times people will hire us right when they're on the verge of burnout. Um, and usually the burnout is a result of a, a lack of impro- like it's, it's a result of improperly placed infrastructure essentially is at least one of the leading causes. Um, let's talk just really quickly about some of this durability and profitability. Um, I guess I've kind of hit the profitability, but I want to specifically um, capture because you and I have both seen infrastructure that's improperly placed, which causes the continual requirement of renewal um, on a structure that should last for a hundred years. I mean, what are some, I'll, I'll share some examples after you, but uh, why don't you start with a couple of examples and then I can um, tie in on the back end there and then we'll, we'll get into just a quick demonstration of, of our process and talk a little bit more about the webinar. For sure. Well, one of the most common ones that, um, that, that you and I have seen is, the, um, and I, I think every property that we've worked on thus far <clears throat> um, has, uh, has the main road access typically comes up a valley. And it's like, it's, it, it doesn't cross it. It literally like follows the valley uh, up into the landscape. And, you know, obviously for, um, you know, water runs downhill and it's concentrated in the valleys. And so we put that critical uh, element um, that allows us to get access to our road or access to our properties. We, we put that in the location where we have a higher propensity for um, faster water, um, like water speeds and water volume. Um, and the interesting thing about water flow is that if you if you double the speed of water, um, it forexes the erosive capacity, or the erosive potential it has. And if you double the volume of water, it forexes the erosive capacity. So if you get double the the speed and double the water, it's sixteen times the erosive capacity. So it's this exponential function. When we put roads in in valleys like that, or, or any infrastructure. Um, we don't realize that we're in this um, basically black swan territory where, um, you know, in, in the right rain conditions, you can get a perfect storm that could wash out your road or any other infrastructure that's located in there. And the reason why folks often put uh, uh, access ways in, in valleys is because they tend to be shallower. And so it's like, oh, well, it's, it's a shallow slope, so it'll be easier to drive up. But ironically, it's, <laughs> it's very dangerous and very costly. And in um, but even in terms of a maintenance thing, like if you're constantly having to replace the, um, the top dressing of gravel on your road or constantly having to recrown it because it's always soft because you know, there's water running in there, um, that's just time and money that could be spent somewhere else in your property. Rob, what are some of the things that, that you see? Yeah, it's, I mean, the buildings is the main one. It's amazing how often people place buildings into wet low zones uh, and then they're constantly pumping out water out of their basements or... Um, or trying to uh, every year they got to take a, a backhoe and kind of divert water around their property because they didn't get the grading or even the location correct. Uh, most recently, though, um, which was really kind of dramatic, was the um, the poor placement of a watering trough for a set of cows uh, and just the amount of erosion that it created because those cows were always coming to the same place in a valley next to a road. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, creating enormous amounts of problems. In fact, there was a huge alluvial fan at the bottom of the hill as a result of that placement um, and, and a couple of other things there too. So um, you really have to think carefully about where you place things uh, it, because the thing is, is that you pay for it to place it there, but then you have to pay for it forever more. Um, and uh, we'll share more of those examples in the webinar coming up uh, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. You can get information and sign up for that webinar in the show notes below. There's a link there. It's totally free. Love to have you. Bring your questions and we'll answer them. Um, before we go today, let's just um, talk a little bit about how we prevent these errors from happening. Um, and so over the years, um, Dakota's a, an incredible farmer. He's a fourth generation farmer. He's basically was born in a pigsty I think and I mean that in the most positive sense possible um, he he like pigs and and farms and 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 uh, farm animals are basically second nature to him um, when you spend some time with Dakota what you realize is that he thinks differently uh, around uh, around farming um, and I'm an engineer and so we found this really rich kind of space between the two of us where we could um, kind of take the process uh, orientation of, of, of an engineer and the agroecology, which is part of T Dakota's genes, and uh, really come up with a, a process to help prevent these mistakes from happening in the first place. And over the last 
three years, we've taken all of my engineering knowledge and all of his farming knowledge, and we've kind of broken it down into five steps. So step number one is clarify. And uh, the goal there is really to, to figure out what your goals are. What, your, what are your values and visions? What are you trying to get to? What is the thing that you need to achieve as a result of managing this property? Do you want to talk about diagnosis a bit, Dakota? Absolutely. And so after we've clarified our vision and our values, which is, if we go back to that first slide, remember that that was a Venn diagram is your vision and values. So we clarify your vision and values. And the second part of that step is we diagnose the property context. And by, by diagnosis, we mean, we mean to try to discover what your property's weak, uh, weakness, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are in relation to your values, right? Because there are no right or wrong decisions. There's only appropriateness to context. And so if you wanted to, to build um, uh, a property that was um, you know, on a floodplain, so if, if you wanted to buy a property that was on a floodplain because your intention was to uh, uh, have that property for making hay for your livestock because the annual floods are gonna replenish the nutrients, you know, similar to what happens um, along the Nile and, and a lot of other ecosystems, um, that makes sense f f because your vision is to, or, and, your, and your, your goals are to have a sustainable um, uh, yield of, of hay from your property. If, if your vision and values for that same property context is to build a mansion on a floodplain, that's, that's uh, an inappropriate decision based on, on what your context is. Right. And I think one of the big things that we've had, the big insights that we've had in all of this work is that uh, the diagnosis is usually the piece that gets missed or it's uh, skipped over and it really represents 80% of the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think a lot of people take these programs, these, these courses, these permaculture design courses, which I think are incredible. I think permaculture is amazing, but there's not enough emphasis on diagnosis. Um, and, you know, a really good doctor um, spends a lot of time in this diagnosis phase to make sure that he's not, he or she is not prescribing the incorrect solution to the problem. And so we spend an enormous amount of time in the diagnosis. Um, the next part is design. And what's really interesting is if you spend enough time in the diagnosis, the design just kind of falls into place. It's actually really easy. Um, once you've got a couple of tools and you've got a couple of processes, the design is actually not the hard part. Um, the hard thinking is really in that first diagnosis. And, and, and also the clarification part is you know, one of the things that Rob and I talk about a lot is how design is an emergent property of clarifying your vision and values and diagnosing your property strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's, it's actually not something that you do. It's something that you almost coax out of, um, uh, out of that earlier work that's, that's really foundational. What was that quote from Michelangelo? Oh, the, uh, when somebody asked him uh, how, how Leonardo da Vinci created uh, uh, the, the Michelangelo sculpture, and um, was, was, it, was it da Vinci or no, so it was Michelangelo. It, it, was, it was the sculpture of David, and, right. and somebody asked him, how did you create it? And he just said, I just cut away everything that wasn't David. Right. And that's, that's what design is. It's just figuring out the pieces we're going to take away <clears throat> Yeah, so and our chisel, is, yeah. our chisel is basically uh, setting people's goals and doing proper diagnosis. Absolutely. Totally. And then the, the last step, once you've got a design, is you go and you implement, and then um, recognizing that implementation is just at the first data point. Mm -hmm. um, ecosystems are dynamic. They're constantly changing. You can't just go put a design in and then not observe and interact um, and respond to feedback. And so... Um, it's really important that we are giving our clients tools so that they can adaptively manage their property through different seasons. I mean, this year, we, you and I were just talking about this, Dakota. We had one of the longest winters um, and one of the driest summers last year, at least in southern Alberta. Um, and so, you know, every year is a little different. And so, you, you know, your design is and your implementation is the first data point in however many years you're going to be managing that property. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And along with that, step four too is is to to make sure that you that you're you're aware of what the appropriate tools and the support is around you. Uh, I think one of the other common mistakes that we see permaculture property owners make is that they feel like they have to do everything themselves. It's like you know when you know you take a um, you buy a property and it's like suddenly you have to be like a farmer, a mechanic, a welder, a road builder. Uh, a dam, you know, engineer, like all these different things. And it's like, you don't have to do all that stuff. It's, it's, uh, 
it's more important to know how to think uh, and how to uh, have a process behind that, and then to know where to find the the people that can that can be experts in their fields. And and so, you know, Rob and I over the years have, have built up a um, uh, basically a repertoire of, of experts that uh, that we use on, on a regular basis when we're working with our clients so that uh, we can give them the appropriate tools and, and support. <clears throat> Absolutely. So we're, we're running over a bit. Let's um, do a quick tour of um, our Google Earth tour. If you guys are interested in a more in-depth conversation around this stuff, make sure you sign up for the webinar below. It's tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Um, it's totally free. Bring your questions. We're going to leave 30 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, so if you have questions around getting the right piece of property, setting it up, um, we're going to go through all of that. Um, and now we're just going to do a quick little uh, <laughs> tour of, of how we uh, go about um, uh, running through our 12 12 different factors, which kind of are encompassed in those five steps that we just spoke about. For sure. So <clears throat> the, the, the work that, that Rob and I have, has, have kind of developed in the last couple of years has evolved out of, uh, you know, just about 50 years of, of um, other, um, you know, other experts in this space and you know there's there's too many names to to mention here but this this we're really standing on the shoulders of giants here and and this has just been kind of our amalgamation of uh, a bunch of different um you know ip and and other insights that people have made <clears throat> uh, over the last 50 years of, of dealing with trying to design uh, ag agroecological systems in alignment with nature's image so uh, that being said, what, what we've basically done is we've taken, we've created a workflow uh, and we've put it into a, a free program called Google Earth Pro. <clears throat> and uh, essentially we've got a, a template that just has a series of exercises that helps people to, uh, you know, clarify their vision, values and resources uh, through a series of, of exercises that, that we've just found really help to pull that information out of the surface. And then there's a diagnosis part where we go, go through and we look at, you know, the climatic factors of your area, the solar patterns, the wind patterns, all this stuff. Um, we pull out um, geographical patterns. <clears throat> and again, we're, we're diagnosing all these different factors here for what your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are. And after going through, you know, all these different factors here, what you'll end up with is something that is a very rich um, uh, tool that that it's, it's your design tool, it's your implementation tool, and it's also your managing and monitoring tool. So, you know, you take all that, you know, the solar patterns, the wind patterns, uh, the temperature and rain patterns for your particular area. <clears throat> you start diving into what your topographical data is for your area, figuring out what the geomorphology of your landscape is, understanding where the slope, uh, um, uh, where the steep slopes are in your property, what direction they're facing via your aspect map, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and a lot of other exercises that we go through. And eventually, um, the, as a result of doing those diagnoses and a whole bunch of other exercises, you, you start to have insights into what the, um, what the potential you know, design for your water systems could look like. So this is actually our farm here our, um, this is our home core section. And this is the, the um, mainframe water design that we came up with for our property as a result of, of going through this, this process. And so, you know, we've actually built a lot of these, uh, um, these dugouts and dams um, since this is actually an older uh, base photo uh, in this year. But, you know, all of that work was uh, that we've done since, I mean, we have over three kilometers of swales on our property We've got, you know, several million gallons of water storage in dugouts and, and dams. <clears throat> and every year we capture more than 10 million gallons of water in our spring runoff events. And all that stuff, you know, builds into you what your, uh, you know, how you access um, these different <clears throat> uh, zones on your property, all this information. So in, in the webinar uh, tomorrow, we're going to be going through this stuff in a little bit more detail and running through some case studies of some other designs that, uh, um, that we've done for folks <clears throat> and how this process and how this workflow has helped them to uh, come up with 
a way to design their own property in nature's image so that they can have <clears throat> so they can have a healthier land, financial freedom, a functional, a functional resilient property and the time to actually enjoy it. Totally. Yep. All right. So we'll just wrap up here, guys. I've got one final little uh, um, screen here to show you guys, and then we're going to wrap up for the day. Um, so join us tomorrow to learn more about these mistakes that people, these three mistakes that people make or permaculture properties make. We're going to talk more about our process and sorting out other issues as well uh, as these three. We're going to talk about case studies and uh, we encourage you guys to bring your questions and we'll bring the answers. So you can sign up with the link below. Space is limited and it's filling up quick. It's amazing how um, we just launched it yesterday and uh, we've already got over 125 people on the call. Yeah. Um, so we can take a few more. Um, so it's going to be tomorrow night, Thursday, April 19th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. All the details are in the show notes below. If you found this interesting, please hit the like button. If you're not subscribed, hit our subscribe button. And we look forward to seeing you guys in the webinar tomorrow night. So thanks so much, guys. We're signing off and we'll talk to you all real soon. Awesome. See you tomorrow.